they're not exclusive. Like we feel like those are exclusive. I think it's actually less compassionate to not impose consequences on an, on actions like that. People in addiction are not treating themselves with dignity and respect, and they need help. Hi again, everybody. Welcome back to The Narrative Podcast. Mike Andrews, Aaron Baird, David Mahan, joining you for another fun-filled episode. Who knows where our conversation will take us? We never know. How are David you not excited? Is, They're actually back at the legislature. Do, you you actually get to do your job now? No, like, I'm, you know I'm, I'm loving it. I just do, got do, hit do, with do, another do, hurricane do. Uh, five minutes ago. Yeah, exactly. So it's like <laughs> exactly. about 12 of those a day, and it wears yeah. you out on a Thursday, Aaron. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Come on, you only got a couple more weeks of this. Yeah, GA, and, then, and, then, and then it starts all over again. Right, exactly. You get a little bit of a break. And we it's cycle all over again, right? What could go wrong? You'll be fine. Yeah. We believe in you, David. You'll be fine. <laughs> yep. We'll get there. We'll get there. We want to start first, though, with some news that uh, came out over the past week from the Associated Press. They wrote a story about the Ed Choice program mm-hmm. in Ohio and certainly CCV and the Ohio Christian Education Network factored prominently into that story. And uh, pretty good piece of reporting as far as we were concerned overall. Pretty, right? Yeah, I was going to say, that, I mean, by, by all means, you know, your, your standard factual errors in there. Uh, but at the end of the day, I thought, hey, yeah, this is kind of kind of the, the case in Ohio. They, they, they're trying to make it off to this nefarious plot uh, that, uh, you know, families are leaving the public education system and going into Christian schools. I do have to say, too, though, the thing that really jumps out to me is I, I have to imagine at this point, like maybe one out of three of our listeners, like hate listen to the narrative. Like we've we've now had like multiple people like cut clips out of the podcast and post them online, or you like in in the story the the AP reporter didn't interview me, uh, just took quotes from the narrative, took quotes from our our podcast where I I said. Um, you know, and, and it's funny because you, you, you get the sense that it was like, oh, well, he said this, you know, on their private podcast that um, everybody gets that, to hear yeah, every Friday. Right, exactly. <laughs> That's, if we're doing our job, lots of people are listening. That we to our shout podcast. from the rooftop. <laughs> he said, he says he wants to get kids out of public schools and into Christian schools because there's only a true education in the Christian environment. Dun, dun, dun. Yes, that is true. That is the case. Gee, well, the partial truth there is that we've been saying that lots more places than Ex- just that the podcast. That is true, exactly. <laughs> that, is, that is not just something we say on the narrative, that is something we shout from the rooftops uh, and in every place we can. Um, but but again, I think it does show, um, you know, the the I think that the, the knock that she tries to imply in some ways when you read it is that CCB has grown by taking because the Ed Choice program has grown, um, and we don't take a dollar of Ed Choice, we don't take a dollar of government money. Uh, we've grown because uh, families believe in what we do and they see the success that we're having really changing education. And I mean, that's the to me, you know, the, this is one more example of, of the left or the media trying to take a shot um, at an organization or individuals that are doing good things and really just showing, oh, wow, this is actually being impactful. It, it shows how much uh, the educational environment has changed in Ohio since uh, CCV brought the Ohio Christian Education Network online. Yeah, even when they promote how many schools we've grown by over the last right. couple of years and how the SGO program statewide has grown, like all net positives, not just for Christian schools, but for, for everybody. school choice, which exactly. is, we've talked about numerous times is the goal of what we're doing here is to lift all boats, not right. just the ones that we like. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, 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 and shocking uh, when uh, you make parents, you, you give parents the option to attend a school uh, that meets their needs. Um, two things. One... Uh, the people that respond to the education crisis are Christians, right? I think it's actually, that says something to the, the conversation we're going to have with Maria later, is who, who are the people that are actually responding outside of the government uh, to this this massive uh, drug crisis in, in Portland and Oregon? It's Christians. Who are the people responding to the massive education crisis? It's Christians. So you see Christian schools pop, popping up. And then for the individual families, when they're trying to think of where they want to send their kids, uh, they're choosing Christian schools, right? I, I, it actually um, it reminds me of a comment that one uh, one large school in the Ohio Christian Education Network, their head of school, made to me during COVID. Um, was he said, you know, when when the school year kicked off, they were getting calls from parents. It started with, "Hey, are you guys open right now?" Right? Because a lot of schools didn't open that fall of 2020. But he said, like probably about a, a third of the way through the school year, all of a sudden the calls changed from, "Are you open?" to 
hey, does your school teach what a man and a woman are? Like, do you guys have men's room? And and it's like, yeah, you know what schools do that? It's Christian schools, yeah. right? But those who are seeking those Christian schools for those purposes are not all Christians. Exactly. That's important to, to bring out. A lot of these folks just want sanity for their kids, as we saw in this recent election. Yeah. And, and when you're looking for sanity, you're looking for what's true. And when you begin on that, this is where Christians, we just have to have the confidence to believe that what we believe is not a truth or our truth, but the truth. It's true. Uh, so that when when people begin on a journey of seeking truth, if they're truly on that, they're going to end up in the church at one point or another. Yeah. Well, speaking of searching for sanity, David over here, trying to, <laughs> trying to keep his wits. The author we've already of all covered. sanity. <laughs> Talk, take us through a little bit what what you've been seeing at the at the state house this week, David. I know it's yeah. been an, another busy week. We had the speaker vote yesterday, which kind of turned out like that Jake Paul Mike Tyson fight. Where there was, <laughs> that's like, that's like, that's like awesome. you kind of knew that's how it was going to go, but there was a did, moment did of just exactly. a little bit of intrigue, yeah. and then it just. Uh, did you stay up and watch that? I did not. I <laughs> I I did not mean to stay up. Just real quick, I did not mean to stay to watch up to watch that, but like I I couldn't sleep that night. And I got on Netflix, and I thought, oh, the, the fight hasn't started yet. So I turned it on, and the moment it started, it was like, Mike Tyson is 58 years old. This man should not be a boxing <laughs> But he didn't enough. even seem 58. He seemed a lot older he than that. Like, I mean, no shuffling. offense to my granny. You yeah. know, God bless her soul. But his knees look like my granny's knees. Exactly. Like, legit. <laughs> just, just bony so, and wobbly. Like, man, it's Mike Tyson. And yeah. midway through, like, just even midway through that first round, you could see Jake Paul was like, Oh, it's gonna look really bad if yeah, I knock out an old right. man right now. Like this is that hurt me to my heart. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go on. Anyway, that speaker vote. I got hey. us off track with a dynamite segue. That was anyway. very good. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway. No, it's been great to have everybody back, and uh, the, the energy's been high, and it's been great. Uh, great energy over there. Had uh, uh, an opportunity to testify for LifeWise and, and some of the bills that. Are, we, we've still got a lot of great work ahead of us and some good things coming, um, you know, between now and the end of the year. So the current Speaker of the House, and just, just for, for listeners' context, this was, you know, if you remember, CCB had endorsed last time around Derek Marin to be Speaker. Um, well, the caucus, the, yeah. as we endorsed him, and then the caucus voted to make yeah. Derek Speaker in, around this time two years ago. And then when the actual, they have to go to the floor to vote, um, in January, once the, all the new members get sworn in, uh, 22 members of the Republican caucus mm. split off. and All and, 32 of the Democrats. And all 32 and elected Jason Stevens speaker. Um, and, and so that was where the whole blue 22, coup 22, 22. thing came about. Um, and there was a lot, I mean, for the last two years, this has been the, the tension at the state house Because what the caucus is... More than anything, what a what a caucus is is it's a promise that you are going to vote together to for the speaker, right? For leadership, right? Who's going to be in charge? Um, and when you break that, then really there is no such thing as a caucus anymore, right? And so everybody who's been paying attention will know all the contention. The amazing part of it, though, from CCB's perspective, and the reason why you know we didn't throw up our hands and and you know sort of gnash our teeth when when it happened was we still knew everyone at, we we had a, a overwhelmingly majority overwhelming majority of support for the backpack bill and safe act and save women's sports right. and there was a senate president and Matt Huffman who was committed to all of those you things you can't say he's not conservative exactly i mean that was that, 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 yeah. that that was the one thing that and, and again it, it's the reason why we were very supportive of Matt Huffman for speaker um, because on school choice, he's been very strong on on these core issues of protecting girls and family. He's been very strong. Um, he's been a friend to the the conservative cause. And so um, and so and anyway, um, so last year, the, the all the vote happened with Jason Stevens. Jason Stevens decided not to run. He announced two days ago or three days ago now that he wasn't going to stand for speaker again. Um, and. The way the the process works is somebody nominates someone to be speaker. So somebody first nominated Matt Huffman to be speaker, and they said, "Are there any other nominations?" Crickets and crickets, and nobody got nominated, and Matt Huffman won unanimously. Yeah. Um, Didn't and even so require a ballot. But. Exactly. So you know, I mean, even now you're seeing all the members down there being really excited about not just uh, current president and president and speaker elect, which is a very weird <laughs> thing to say. I don't think that's ever been said before. Um, uh, Matt Huffman, but also the leadership team he put in place. I mean, yeah. both both sponsors of the backpack bill um, are uh, uh, are in leadership. Um, the 
you know, a good friend of CCV who's been on the podcast before, Brian Stewart, is finance chair. Huge with uh, helping us with House Bill 68. House Bill 68, yeah. exactly. I mean, it really it, it really is a phenomenal leadership team in the, in the House. And not and meanwhile, in the Senate, no fireworks at all, but good friend of CCV, good yeah. friend of the cause, speaker at the Essential Summit, uh, Senate uh, Majority Leader and President-elect, uh, uh, Rob McCauley is the the president over there, and so it really is. We're in in great position for the future. But but I'm I'm encouraged that uh, he he had a you know he ran a tight ship in the Senate. We need a tight ship in the House. Yeah, yeah we'll see where we go from here. No, there's other stuff too. Life wise, that, that yeah. that's you know that guys. I for the testimony, I really did some research into this group. I mean, they're working with thirty thousand kids in the yeah. state of Ohio, wow. and I know that there was this big Westerville school board thing where Westerville they. Um, they reneged and, and pulled LifeWise out after two years of successful programming. And everybody's battling back and forth. Right? You know, we had this many people at the meeting, but you didn't have 30,000 kids right. at the meeting. You didn't have 450 some schools yeah. represented at the meeting, representing like thousands of parents right, yeah. of these kids, um, 99 percent of which say that the program is amazing. And we recommend it to other people. Yeah. And when they surveyed almost 800 teachers, 90% of the teachers said, hey, this is a, this program is a benefit not just to the student, but to the school. So that's where I focus my testimony testimony in the Senate. Not that it's going to be a heavy lift over there, but it uh, sounds like they wanted to vet the bill well. Um, it's been vetted in the House already, but they wanted to kind of do the same thing in the Senate. Um, but it's looking like we're going to get a good outcome. Yeah, we, we think one. there's a good chance that, that that'll get done here in Lame Duck, I think. Weeks. Um, you know, I think one of the important things, too, you know, David talked a lot about the supporters. I think when you look at the opposition of this bill, you know, it, it's not families in the school district no. that oppose this, right? It's not the people that, the, the kids that we're supposed to be serving. It, it tends to be activists, right? The, the, the usual suspects. That, 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 that oppose it. And you see, like, the, this Honesty for Ohio Education group uh, that has literally put together a playbook, Right. With talking points and all of these types of things that are it's chock full of lies. Right. Um, talking about how this violates separation of church and state. They're literally leaving the school to do this. Right. I, I mean, and they don't they actually don't even have to leave the school by by law to, yeah. to do something like this. But under the I should say by by the federal constitution. Um, but but they, they do in, in the LifeWise case. Um, and, and so it's it's one of these things where you have to understand this is where the left is today, and I think for me, this LifeWise situation just just really highlights how much disdain a portion of the left has for Christianity, right? When when you're going into their territory and allowing the name of Jesus to be proclaimed, or into their hours of the day that they think they own your kids um, to uh, allow those kids to access a Bible education, they will they cannot let that stand because it is it is that's their time. Uh, to have your child's heart in mind. And they say um, that. They right. actually say when when you hear them say local control, they mean local control of school boards over your children. That's over what they your mean. Child. And these are elected officials, just like, yep. you know, the politicians we all know, the senators, the state reps. But yeah. those school board men- members are elected officials. Which, which is also why, by the way, th- this mentality is why the other priority bill we have over there is um, House Bill 8, which is the Parents' Bill of Rights. Uh, because, again, this is one of these pieces of legislation that uh, this helps establish that sort of legal precedent, mm-hmm. right? That says it's the parent that has the fundamental right to direct the upbringing, education, and healthcare decisions of their kids. Because th- this is needed to put in law because there are government bureaucrats that believe, no, it is their right to decide the upbringing, education, and healthcare decisions of your kids. Yeah, and if not the school board, it's the community. You've right. been hearing that a lot, right? The community yep. decides. Right. And, and so these I feel like both of these uh, ideas have, have big possibilities. I actually do think as well um, the, the bill to require age verification to access porn sites um, has, a, has a chance of getting done. Um, that bill is a little bit further back in the process, but it's something we're, we're going to be pushing for because it has this concept has passed in, in states uh, with bipartisan support. Actually, it has a, a Democrat on the, the Senate bill right now. And so. Um, I, there, there is actually still some substantive stuff that can happen in Ohio, this, this lame duck. Well, there's a lot that we can keep our listeners up to date on. We certainly will do that over the, the coming weeks and in early December. Uh, nothing from us next week, though. It's Thanksgiving. Yes. We're going to be taking a break to enjoy some time with family and certainly want to thank our listeners for, for making the podcast a success. You know, we didn't talk about this a couple weeks ago, but we passed 100 episodes, guys. I don't hey, know. Hey, we did. Wow. I didn't realize wow. that. Hey. So. 
Who, uh, who knew they, from, they were going to make it beginnings long. with the exactly. two of you to version <laughs> uh, 2.0 with some real talent on board? I think I'd get a couple more days off in 2025 <laughs> for that. Oh. You know, too many already. That's the, <laughs> <laughs> we're going backwards. We're taking days back. <laughs> That's right. All you do yeah. is use them to kill stuff anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to chat as Aaron teed up already with, with his wife, Maria, about an article that she wrote, the cover story for Christianity Today uh, this week about the situation of drugs being decriminalized in Portland, Oregon. It's a, a great story, a deep dive into a lot of the issues that led to that and, and what's happening on the streets there. Great conversation. Stick around. You don't want to miss it on the narrative. Hey, narrative listeners. You know, Christians in the marketplace today face more unique and challenging threats than ever before. Businesses are following woke capitalism. Chambers of commerce are beholden to social justice. And secular activists are chipping away Christians' First Amendment rights. As Ohio's only Christian Chamber of Commerce, the Christian Business Partnership stands in the gap to advocate for, to educate, and to celebrate Christian business owners. Joining the partnership also allows businesses to provide their employees with health care insurance, workers' compensation, and exclusive banking and educational discounts. To find out more and to join, go to cbpohio.org. That's cbpohio.org. And we're back on the narrative. Mike Andrews, Aaron Bear, David Mahan, and joined now by Maria Bear, who at this point yeah. needs no introduction, exactly. I would hope. It's like, what, third or fourth third time or on the podcast? Third or fourth time, yeah, regular guest here now. On the wow, podcast. Yeah, right? regular. Regular, regular segment. Practically yeah. a regular. Exactly. Definitely more favored than some bears on the sure. podcast. Well, that that's all yeah, I'm going to say. Why do you have that. to even say in the first place? <laughs> I'm just saying, it's, it's no. It brings me joy. It's no, that's, that's good. Why. That's good. <laughs> well, Maria, we have you here today to talk about an article that uh, you had published in Christianity Today really about the situation in Portland and, and some mm-hmm. of the efforts we're seeing there to cope with a disastrous piece of legislation that, that passed yeah. there, which essentially opened the floodgates for illicit drug use in mm-hmm. ways that are, are really incomprehensible <laughs> to any modern society. But mm-hmm. uh, just to tee us off, talk a little bit about this article and what you saw when, when you were putting it together. Yeah, sure. Um, First, I have to apologize for anybody who is watching us on video for my (laughs) Y'all gonna zoom in on this? First of all, I just really love America. So if you you can't see me and you're just listening now. She's dressed like this since Trump won. (laughs) Every day. It's been... I I have on a lot of Americana right now. So it is uh, at our girls' school. It's like a spirit week. And today was the teachers were supposed to dress dress as their favorite holiday. So I was recess lady today. So I'm the 4th of July. Also just very patriotic generally, but I don't usually go around wearing Aaron's American flag t-shirt and socks. Lady Liberty. Lady Lady Liberty. Okay. Okay. So back to the artist. (laughs) Now that we have established your patriotism. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Let's establish those bona fides first. Um, so yes, in 2021, the state of Oregon voted, it was a ballot measure. So the voters of Oregon voted to decriminalize uh, small amounts, which is relative, of hard drugs, possession of small amounts of hard drugs. So all the way up to heroin, fentanyl. Um, if you were caught with um, less than a certain amount, don't I don't know exactly what it was, uh, then it was downgraded to a misdemeanor. And essentially the way they were going to enforce this was you would be issued a citation and you could either pay the citation or you could call this recovery hotline that the state set up that was supposed to connect people to recovery services. Uh, all you had to do was call it. You didn't even have to follow through with recovery to avoid the $100 fine. After, I think, about three years of this um, being in effect, fewer than uh, – certainly fewer than 100 people ever even called that line. Wow. By the time I went out to Portland last summer, police had just absolutely stopped issuing any citations at all because um, – this was kind of an irrational strategy from the start. This is not a community of people for whom enforcement of a citation is really possible. You have to have a fixed address and presumably a line of credit or, you know, some kind of hundred dollars to pay a hundred dollar fine. hundred. Exactly. So, um, it, it, that didn't work for obvious reasons. Um, it also was really unfortunate timing because fentanyl hadn't quite made it to Oregon by the time this um, law went into effect. I argue that the law was a terrible idea to begin with, mm-hmm. but but they were not seeing the number of overdose deaths that we've now seen since fentanyl really um, took, you know, in 
it, it kind of moved its way west across the country. Um, and so it was kind of just getting to Oregon by the time this went into effect. This was also in the middle-ish of the pandemic. So there was a lot of um, ingredients in the soup that kind of made this uh, even worse. But I, I still think it was a flawed strategy from the start. But um, shocking not many people, the number of overdose sky, the number of overdoses in Oregon skyrocketed after this went into effect. Um, people were moving in from out of state into Oregon once this took effect. So the number of homeless in Oregon spiked. Now, it spiked everywhere across the country during the same season, but way higher, exponentially higher in Oregon than other states. Um, and so about eight months ago now, uh, the governor of Oregon signed a bill recriminalizing hard drugs. Um, and I, I wanted to look at what what was it like for Christian ministries in particular who deal with addiction recovery throughout the decriminalization and then now with it being recriminalized, you know, what changes does that mean for them? Um, and, you know, so I was fortunate enough to go out to Portland last summer and meet with several different ministries in downtown Portland about, you know, their work in this area. And, you know, the the progressive line is including the governor who signed the recriminalization is, well, this effort didn't work because we didn't have enough recovery services available. Essentially, the state didn't spend enough money setting up state-sponsored recovery facilities. And so, you know, there's this number that so many officials quote, 3,000 bed shortage. We have a 3,000 bed shortage in Oregon um, of the number of addiction recovery beds. If you look at Oregon's tally of addiction recovery beds that, that the Department of Health counts, Um, It is lower than some states in the country. However, if you drill into what beds they are willing to count is a different story. So, again, I met with four different Christian ministries within about a three-mile radius of downtown Portland. None of those beds are counted by the state, and all of them had open capacity. So they're not counted because they don't uh, seek state licensure. And they don't seek state licensure because there are strings attached to state licensure, such as your ability to share the gospel or to include, you know, mandatory Bible study or church attendance in recovery, which we know statistically um, is correlated to much higher success rates of recovery. People need a spiritual component. So it goes both ways. A lot of these ministries, understandably, are wary of um, asking for state support and licensure, but But then the result is the state doesn't license them, so then the state doesn't count them. But if nothing else, it is deeply dishonest then of the state to say, this didn't work because we don't have enough beds, because there are definitely enough beds. And and actually, every ministry I spoke to said when decriminalization went into effect, the number of people coming in for recovery services went down. And I think if you have a realistic view of human nature, that um, is somewhat easy to understand. Not just a realistic view of human nature, but of addiction itself, because I truly think addiction is one of the most difficult things that a person can weather and one of the most difficult things to recover from. And one of the things you hear time and time again from speaking with people who've been through it um, is that they needed to hit some kind of rock bottom or they needed some kind of legal threat to motivate recovery because recovery is so uniquely painful, um, both physically, emotionally, mentally. I mean, you've got to reckon with what you've done with your life. You've got to deal with the mental and physical. So when you take away the threat of prison time or loss of custody or whatever it is, uh, you really take away a key motivating factor for a lot of people to get clean. So re- there's... Um there's a lot in the story to, to to unpack, and and it's the it is the cover story, little brag, little cover story of the November December Christianity Today. Um, but you went out to Portland, um, and one of the things that you know really jumped out to me as you were talking about the story is that you know for a lot of cities, even in Ohio, basically every major metropolitan area in the country is pursuing just one path of what they want their city to become. Right. And, and it's 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 a hard drive leftward. Um, and it's, you know, pretty much mirroring what you see happening in cities. They, they all want to become San Francisco and New York um, or Portland. I even you and I, I remember laughed about uh, now in downtown Columbus, they've decided to build these outdoor toilets that are lovingly called Portland Lose mm-hmm. um, because this idea came from Portland. 
Um, number but, two Broad Street. It literally is number it's two. Number that's to that's such not a, joke. a shame. I know. Oh but, my but gosh. Let's, let's let's put a pin in that because that's a, that's a rabbit trail. <laughs> Come on. But, but it, it it highlights again all of these cities, cities like Columbus, want to become these big coastal cities. They want that's the that's the model they're following. But what was actually Portland like, right? Portland is mm. running headlong down this path. Obviously, this was a statewide uh, initiative, but Portland is the hardest hit. What was that yeah. experience like in Portland, especially compared to living in Columbus or, or yeah. in some of these other cities? Here? Well, it's interesting. I think that some, I mean, a lot of their, I think the district attorney there was voted out. Like there, there's been a little bit of a pendulum shift backwards because it's one thing, this was the impression I got to, especially talking to a lot of the pastors and people who run the addiction recovery ministries is that. There are people at the state level and at the city leadership level who talk a lot about the issues of addiction and how we want our city to run and et cetera, who have less than zero amount of experience actually dealing with the issue. So then you have the people on the ground who know what it's like to try and help people into recovery and to try and lead a city that's dealing with the homelessness crisis. And usually their ideas about how to accomplish it is very, are very, very different. And I, that's one of the things that, that stood out to me there and is starting, unfortunately, um, you know, stands out to me here in Columbus as well, because I think the biggest thing I took away from it, I mean, when I landed there, I remember feeling like that. Now, it it does not look like this in every neighborhood of Portland. There's still some very wealthy, uh, you know, gated communities there. There's some of the areas right in downtown Portland, you know, like the, the business community. It's there's a lot of clean streets. There had just been a um, some sort of city event. I don't remember if it was a parade or something. This was in June. And so I kept remarking like, oh, this park is really clean. I didn't. And everybody would say, oh, they just did a sweep. They just did a sweep because we had some kind of event, which means the police just came through and kicked out everybody living in tents. And people told me this in a tone of like, they'll be back in a couple of days. So it was, you know, just happened to be that that moment. It felt in some areas, though, especially in... Um, you know, kind of that west of the Burnside Bridge area of Portland, it felt like a third world country. It, it was a little different because, um, you know, there were because of you could turn the corner and it would look different. So, you know, I've spent some time in South America and been to some really, really poor countries and have seen that kind of poverty and and frankly, um, dirt like grime. You got the sense in some of these neighborhoods, too, that city services had kind of started just avoiding the areas, you know, so like trash pickups not happening. Um, There are just alleyways of literal. I mean, it looks like, you know, the pictures that you you see of the, the, the dump in India, you know, that are just mounds of trash like that exists there. Um, it was also strange going into just normal stores and, you know, I go into like a Whole Foods and there's armed security is a strange feeling. Also, it's always private security, which is a whole right. other level of strange. <laughs> is this where the chop zone was, right? Where yes. they took over the... No, that was in Seattle. Seattle. That okay. was in Seattle. There was a, a similar movement in Portland, but it didn't reach that level. Right. Um, that, but, but this is another fascinating thing because the area where that was is like sparkly clean now. Hmm. And I think that the city has done some um, PR mitigation in the areas that Memory were. Memory holding is the uh, Yes, <laughs> that's a much uh, yeah. less diplomatic way of putting it. Yeah. But yeah, um, it was scary. And, yeah. and it was really sad. The other thing was I I was, it Which was just, jarring. Just for the record here, she doesn't tell me where she's going on. Like she told me she's going to Portland. And then afterwards she calls me and says, yeah, I drove through. I rode a bike well, you told through me, the third. Where clear. were you, Aaron? I, <laughs> Aaron told me. Please do not walk around by yourself. And so I rented a bike. She rented a, a bike, bike by herself. I, nice. yeah. I held to the letter of yeah. the law. The other thing I was just going to say is one of the other most jarring parts of it for me um, personally being there was it was hard to get used to just seeing bodies on the sidewalk. I, I don't think I ever saw anybody who had passed away. But I w- certainly walked past a lot of people that I was not sure about, you know. And I so I would ask the people in these ministries, like, what? How does this work? You guys are walking past people every day. Like, how can you tell? And they all, it's sort of like they've just come to understand how to live. It's become a part of daily life. So they all are carrying around Narcan, which is the 
brand name of naloxone that can reverse an overdose. But they're also too like, well, you look for if there's a crowd gathered around them, you know, usually that means there's a problem. Or if their fingers or their face has kind of turned a gray color, then that's a sign that there's a problem. But you're just genuinely stepping over people who appear to be sleeping. And it's it's really strange and, and upsetting. Yeah. And just for the record here, before these guys get too judgmental with me, David let, David's wife works at a pregnancy what? center of the hood. How and Mike, bring Mike's me wife, it is. Mike, Mike's wife lives in the backwoods, basically, which is deliverance out there. So you know, at the same time, <laughs> don't 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 get on by, my by case herself here. with six kids. Exactly. That's so what I do before, to my wife. if wow. we're talking danger here, uh, I'm I'm, I'm absolved. Anyway, um, whatever you have to tell yourself. <laughs> oh my word. Um, so uh, uh, sorry, like, you know, for me, Reed, with one of the things when we're, you know, I talk about this a lot. Um, when we're trying to understand or we're, we're talking about these these issues, we always want to try to describe, uh, you know, our opposition's um, uh, arguments in a way that they would recognize, mm-hmm. right? So how would the the leadership of Portland or even like the advocates in Portland defend what they did? And, and this is something very, I mean, very real for the Ohio context. They basically brought the same proposal here in 2018 as a yeah. constitutional amendment and we defeated it. Um, but obviously... In, in Oregon, they weren't so so lucky. Yeah. I think at the heart of this problem is a fundamental misunderstanding of addiction, um, also poverty, to be honest. I think the, the leadership of Oregon and Portland have a line where their belief is that people who are struggling with addiction or people who are in extreme poverty, they want to improve their lives. So they want to get sober or they want to get a job or find stable housing. Um, But there are just like barriers that are in their way that, you know, some other person or entity has put in their, in their path. So that's why it's the city's job then, or the state's job or whoever to break down those barriers. So we have to destigmatize the way we talk about addiction. It's a mental health. This is an, an um, initiative in Ohio right now that, drives me crazy because I can't imagine who they think they're talking to with Mm -hmm. these ads. But we have to talk about addiction as if it's a mental health issue. It's not, you know, a deliberate um, bad decision or bad behavior. I don't understand why it can't be both. I I certainly, yeah, I see evidence in, in both camps. But I think the fundamental argument is people want to get clean. People want to get housing. People don't want to be in poverty. And we just haven't given them the resources they need. So we need more state. This is where you get the, we didn't have enough state recovery beds. That argument immediately flies out the window when, again, you look at how many people called the hotline to connect you to recovery service, like fewer than a hundred. Thousands and thousands of those citations were issued in the first couple of years of that uh, measure. And nobody called. So the suggestion that these are it's thousands and thousands of people who want to get clean but don't know where to go is just completely falsifiable. I mean, it's it's demonstrably untrue. But that, I think, is the argument. And again, I think that's the main issue is that you're you're getting these policies that are put in place by people who don't have experience either with addiction themselves or working with people who have been addicted or who are in addiction recovery. Um, and I, I also think it's an inability to sort of walk and chew gum at the same time when it comes to, um, you know, talking about culture, because it's as if in order to say like a person really needs the legal stick in the carrot and stick, you know, um, metaphor, they need the stick. A, a lot of people are going to require that in order to get into sobriety. People hear that and say, oh, my gosh, you're, you're denigrating the character of people who are dealing with a mental health issue, which is addiction. I don't think that is a, a, um, a testament to anybody's character at all. I have no problem believing that if I were struggling in the throes of a addiction to methamphetamines that I would require a legal. You're talking about the nature of addiction, not the nature of a person's character. And the nature of humanity. I mean, that, that's one exactly. of those things like a, a lot of us, I'm, I'm sure everybody can think of a time that they were doing something that was going headlong the wrong way, and they ran into a, a, the consequences of that decision, and it was only when they hit the consequences that they changed their course. I mean, it, it's, it's or basic when, human nature. when the threat that, like, to continue in your – you have to make continuing in the addiction worse, seem worse to a person right. than getting sober. Yeah. And there is little – I think there is truly little in the world that when you're in the throes of it will seem worse to you. Yeah. And, and it – 
yeah, people just people need that. And I, I'm I'm saying this. I mean, when I was in Portland, I talked to at least a dozen men and women who were actively addicted mm-hmm. and asking them, like, what would it take for you? you know, do you want to keep doing this? Do you want to? And nobody was ever like, I love this. My life is complete joy and I, everything's wonderful. Um, and I also, you know, I take what everybody says with a grain of salt because every, you know, you're talking to a reporter, you're dressing up what you're saying. But um, most of them were like, I don't really see the point. You know, like I... I can get, I know where to go to get food. I know where to go to get clothing, to get a tent. One guy had just qualified for permanent housing from the Oregon Housing Authority, and they have no sobriety requirements. So he'll just, he was about to get an apartment. Um, you know, they, they have those basic needs met. And a lot of them, unfortunately, um, this is common when you're struggling with addiction, have lost touch with family and friends. You know, they don't have a community of people who are helping them. I think that's another major factor in addiction. And uh, they they don't want, you know, if I said you could go into recovery to here's a bed right here and it's free and they'll give you every meal and like the barrier is so high because then they know I go into this recovery program, I have to give up my cell phone. I'm going to go through at least 30 days of pretty unbearable physical symptoms. Um, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm aware that I'm going to be in sobriety for the rest of my life. Like it's an ongoing struggle once you've been in it. <laughs> I mean, who, wa- who wants to do that? Yeah, I'm really curious about the safety net, right, that you were talking about. Because, mm-hmm. <clears throat> you know, when you, when you mentioned the private enforcement that was going on in the yeah. stores— they did defund their police back yes. then, like to the tune of fifteen million. Still a huge issue, right? Right, and so that's a part of the safety net somewhere, right? Yeah. And and how we police them, for sure, yeah. is a concern. But what about the church, though? Because you mentioned you, you spoke to some of the church. Where are they at? Or do we just just keep giving everybody Narcan? I know some states have literally given dope out to everybody um, with clean needles and things. Yeah. Uh, you know, what are you seeing with the church? How are they respond? Well, that exists in Portland, too, in some areas. It's different from church to church. I think the, the ministries that I spoke with that are addiction recovery ministries are all very, um, very bold about saying, like, we need more enforcement okay. and about building relationships with, you know, OK, so if the city council or the state leaders in Oregon are not going to connect with them or then they'll try to they're trying to get to know local judges and lo- even local police deputies like, hey, if you catch somebody, you know, why don't you bring them here? Bring them here first or whatever, you know, tell them they can that they're trying to build those connections. I think some of them are. Are they being penalized? I mean, or because because I know uh, that they're not their beds aren't being included. Right? right. So are they being penalized for helping them or are they not being financially aided? They're not being financially aided. Okay. Some some of them are. I mean, one one of the ministries I talked to had just gotten a one time grant for a new building for the women and their addiction recovery. But they are not. There's a lot of money mm. in addiction recovery, and they're right. very wary, understandably, of applying for it. And there there are regulations in Oregon, like under Oregon Health Code, that's like you you would have to allow men who say they're women to go into women's restrooms okay. or to go into the women's recovery program. So. Understandably, they're wary, I think, of taking state money right now. That should hopefully change. When it comes to churches, I mean, Portland is a very progressive city. And so I think there are a lot of churches with a lot of sweet brothers and sisters there, um, but also a lot of progressivism in the churches, too. And unfortunately, the language about, you know, we need to be compassionate when we talk about addiction and we need to Um, treat people with dignity and respect. A lot of that has captured people's minds um, in an unhelpful way. Mm -hmm. And I've seen churches, I wouldn't say like actively, I didn't see any churches or hear of any churches like giving out clean needles or anything like that. But certainly um, some of the pastors I spoke with are are wary of police or, uh, you know, criminal punishments for this in a way that I think is probably ultimately unhelpful. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I went to one church that they can they partner with the city to be a warming shelter in the colder months and people can stay there. And and this church in particular were telling me how, you know, they just include a line item in their budget is for window repair because they just know their windows are going to be broken pretty consistently and um, stuff like that. So yeah. I, I think it's a hard um, it's a hard needle to thread. For a church, but uh, 
yeah, unfortunately, I think a lot of the progressive talking points have taken hold as well. When you were talking to the recovery ministries themselves, the people that are really boots on the ground and, yeah. and working with these people on a daily basis, what's their take of this compassion issue? Because there is that side where you want to treat the person as an image bearer, totally. but truly... There, to your point, Aaron, there do need to be consequences. Like you need to hit a wall if you're gonna if you're gonna stop and turn around. And ultimately, with a Christian ministry, they have the ability to also offer the hope of the gospel in that yeah. too. Yeah. So, how do they approach that in treating people with dignity and respect, but also realizing that that there may need to be some some consequences yeah. or, or something that's a little heavier to to apply the pressure that these people need to be able to break the cycle of addiction. addiction. Totally. So I actually think the way you asked that question is important to look at because they're not exclusive. Like we feel like those are exclusive. I think it's actually less compassionate to not impose a, um, consequences on, an, on actions like that. People in addiction, people who are deeply, deeply in addiction – are not treating themselves with dignity and respect and they need help just as like children who are doing something risky and dangerous or stupid need help. Um, And again, this is not a commentary at all on the character of these people. It's a commentary on addiction and human nature. Mm -hmm. Addiction. I mean, using drugs is a terrible decision. People make really bad decisions. I don't want to make it sound like these are all just helpless people who fell into bad luck. I think there is some just bad circumstance involved, but um, it is, you know, people have a choice and a lot of times make bad choices. But uh, impo- uh, most of the people running the addiction recovery ministries that I s- interviewed, um, at them or most of the people on their staff have been through recovery themselves. Mm-hmm. So to them, the they're kind of immune to the, well, you're not being compassionate kind of talk because they know what it took for them. And it's it's almost like people who've been through combat. They're just like, okay, have your little conversations over there about, you know, the most respectful or kind way to do this and do your little PR initiative state of Ohio on how addiction is a mental health crisis. We will be over here doing the actual stuff. Like it, it is so hard, you know, and they'll say, one of the guys said, I know that our, recovery ministry has so many barriers to entry. Like the fact that you have to surrender your phone. You can't go out without an escort for the first six months that you're here. You have to go to Bible study. You have to go to church. Like we know that that's a huge barrier for people coming in here. We also know if we don't have those things in place, we're not going to be successful. So it's, we got to pray that the Lord brings people in here, hope that the state would partner with us in a more effective way. Um, and the the police want to as well, but there's not enough of them anymore. And they've been so demonized. I mean, the police don't even go to that neighborhood that's west of the Burnside Bridge. It's they have it's something called the city street re- response team that go. And that and you part, saw them, right? You saw yeah, them in I action. Did. Yeah. yeah, I did. Yeah, and the you know the police just are not wanted there. And it's what, what did that city team response whatever. That was interesting. It that was a a difficult. Yeah, it was a strange experience. So there's a woman. And what is it first? On the, yeah, sorry. So the, you're right. The city street response team in Portland is like a um, – the idea – this was an initiative that passed in 2020, I think, that was we're going to send – instead of sending police because police were persona non grata um, in that ACAB. era. ACAB. ACAB. Um, instead of sending police to non, um, you know, like physical or violent uh, – to mental health crises, we're going to send mental and behavioral health personnel. It's unclear to me exactly who these personnel are. I don't think these are all like licensed therapists. Yeah. They're city workers, but it's, they're, it's supposed to be some sort of level in between, um, you know, he- health. Like you're not going to send an ambulance, but you also don't need the police. So you need something in between to like diffuse tough situations. Well, all this really has become, at least what I saw, is like, We're not sure if this person is overdosing and we need someone to come check or this person is sitting. I mean, I saw a video on Twitter yesterday from a a journalist of a person who had been laying in the same spot on the same sidewalk for three days and hadn't moved. And the person was alive but didn't want to be removed. So they called the street response team because, I mean, this man is soiling himself. He wanted to die. Right. And he was on a city sidewalk. It's, it's really hard to know what to do. So when I saw them, there was a woman who was on the sidewalk, just kind of moaning and rolling back and forth under Mm -hmm. a couple blankets. 
And the street response team is standing there. They have a wheelchair, and they're just kind of talking to each other because the woman is not able to have a coherent conversation with them, and they were trying to decide what to do. I don't even know what ultimately happened. They wouldn't speak to me, but um, it was sad. So you had some, um, you had one conversation in particular that's just stuck with me with a, a guy who was using, um, and I, and I think this this speaks a lot to um, how we uh, help. You know, I think for a lot of Christians today, compassion is the right response when we see homeless. Right? I mean, we're we're uh, expressly called, I think, all the time about you know uh, if you know if you gave a cup of water to the. Mm. Um, to the, the the homeless person, you know, you did that to me, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I think about that regularly, and we see people on our streets in in Columbus and, and Cleveland mm-hmm. and Cincinnati, all over in Phoenix, and you know, all over the place. Um, but you had a conversation with an individual uh, who was using, who was actually uh, high at the moment. You were talking to him, somewhat high, buzz, whatever, um, and uh, about. Wanting to get clean, can you just tell that story because it, it stuck? Yeah, there was there's this initiative called Night Strike that it used to be a city initiative in Portland, but now it's been taken over by a City Team, which is one of the ministries I talked with. They go under the bridge, um, just there on the river every Thursday night, and they have these little stations set up. You can get dinner, you can get your hair cut, you can get a free book. They had like a little library, which was so cool. Um, you can get clothing. You can get your feet washed, which at first I thought, oh, is this like a, you know, a sort of um, gospel opportunity? And I know that there are volunteers there who are sharing a gospel with people, but it was actually, you know, they told me like when you're living outside, um, your feet are one of the hardest parts of the body to keep clean. And also, uh, you know, it can be the, the most uncomfortable or the most prone to infection and so this was, you know, just a, a literally a beautiful, trench foot. I mean, it's like sure, World War I. yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I, I went to Night Strike and I was just chatting with people who had come to get food because it people know that it's going to be there every Thursday. So it, a lot of the same folks come um, every week. And uh, yeah, I was talking to a gentleman about like, hey, so do you want to get clean? This was kind of my pressing question when I went there. Everybody I talked to because again, this was the line from all the leaders was like. Everybody wants to get clean. We're just not giving them enough resources. So do you want to get clean? And he said, no, I tried it. It didn't It didn't work. You know, he relapsed. Um, his family wouldn't talk to him anymore. He'd been living on the streets for over 10 years. He was like, I got, you know, I know where to go to get my food. I know where to go to get clothing. And, and he said, you know, I'm diabetic. I'm over 50. I'm going to die soon anyway. I might as well enjoy my life was kind of. And again, I take this with a grain of salt. I don't think... I'm sure that he um, is is sad, you know, mm-hmm. is sad, and and doesn't like a lot of aspects of his life. I mean, the uh, the other thing I heard from a lot of these folks was it's just incredibly dangerous. Like they, the, everyone is on guard against everybody else. People are making horrible decisions. People have knives and weapons. It's kind of cutthroat when you're living um, outside and everybody's using and looking for the next hit, you know. And he was aware of that. He said, that's that's the only downside really for me is like, it's, it's scary. I don't know who's out to get me, whatever kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but sorry, what, what did you ask me about yeah, getting about, help? You know, about uh, how do we help? You how know, do we help? Again, how, yeah. how do we help? And, and is giving all, oh, you know, right, giving right, right. all these things. Like, yeah. again, he, he has a place to get his tent. He has a place to get his yeah. clothes. You, you know, yeah. in, the, in the pictures uh, in the magazine, which which I, I really commend. Obviously, go read the article, but the, the photography is, is beautiful. phenomenal. Yeah, it was pretty devastating. Um, but there's whole, you know, alleyways just covered in free T-shirts, right, and clothing yeah, and things think like that. it's so, so hard to know what the balance is because, again, like, if you walk past somebody actively shivering, like potentially freezing to death, and you have a blanket – I have a hard time saying you shouldn't give the blanket. Like it's, and this will be a a person by person, situation by situation decision. Like I think the Holy Spirit and discernment is going to be so important here. But there's a level of saturation that I think Portland has reached, um, which is a cautionary tale for other cities like ours, where once it becomes so easy to get and it's everywhere and you can get literally all of your needs met. Um, you're, again, taking away some of the motivation to get clean mm-hmm. because it's hard to sleep outside when it's cold. But if you don't have to sleep outside when it's cold, 
you know, you can get a tent, you can get a blanket, you can get a cot, you can, you know, whatever it is. And there's so much available. Like there's no more scarcity of it. Um, again, it's a, a bigger barrier to getting clean. It's a really hard line to, to walk. Uh, and I think some of the, you know, I think one of the best ways right now that these ministries in Portland are doing it, I mean, I think a, a better police response is really going to be a huge key. But is these things like Night Strike are them saying, it's almost like PR to to future clients. Like, we're here. We exist. We have a recovery ministry. We A lot of us have been through it ourselves. So when your rock bottom does come, you have a name in mind. Like, mm-hmm. you know where we're located. You know where to go. And, that, and that's kind of their um, thought. Because if you just go up to people and say, hey, come get clean, it, it just doesn't work that way, unfortunately. As they kind of grapple with the results, uh, the aftermath, the unintended consequences, whatever you want to say, of passing this legislation, mm-hmm. are they doing anything to, to turn the tide beyond the governor signing the bill that recriminalized some of the drugs? Are, are there practical things going on on the streets that could turn the tide in Portland? Last I heard, they were trying to establish a county-by-county county deflection program mm-hmm. where there would be criminal penalties, but again, instead of just shuffling everybody to jail, which can be effective— but they don't have the space necessarily. Um, partnering with local addiction recovery and detox centers to say, like, if this person is nonviolent or maybe a first or second time offender with drugs, can we bring them here first and offer them recovery as opposed to jail? You know, give them the choice between the two. And so a lot of the ministries I spoke with had met with county officials, like, hoping to be put on that deflection list. But like I said, if they don't have enough police, it's kind of moot because – and they, they really have a dearth of police. And now they're dealing with not just that they've been defunded. I think people are politically ready to refund a lot of it. They don't have enough people to signing up to be police, you know, going to the academy. because And who – that's going to be a harder problem to solve than I think they anticipated. Um, and I, But I think that's going to be key to impl- – they've got some – you know, some common sense coming in, like we, you know, obviously we have to recriminalize it. It's going to be interesting to see how they spread the word that it's been recriminalized. None of the people I spoke to who are living on the street were aware of it yet. It hadn't gone into effect. It went into effect this uh, in September. And I think word kind of is mouth to mouth on the street, but it'll, it, it really won't spread until it actually starts getting enforced. And that's going to be, I think, their biggest hurdle. They just need more police. Well, Maria, thanks for writing this article. I had a chance to read it in preparation for our conversation. It's great journalism from the standpoint that it's both informational and educational. And I hope our our audience will definitely go check this out. This is some truly great work. So thank you for taking the time to put it together and joining us today to talk about it. Thank you guys for having me in my ridiculous Not every day you get a valedictorian. Thank you for bringing that up. I was wearing my red, white, and blue medal, but you're right, David. Thank you for asking. It is a valedictorian medal. I was valedictorian of my high school class. Something I did not get. Aaron, were you the valedictorian? (laughs) I was salutatorian of See my that, college uh, class. Does that, that count? There you go. Right? So, it doesn't. It, it doesn't, doesn't count, count at all. That's good. It doesn't that's good. count <laughs> at all. That's but awesome. we're grateful that you put all your education to thanks. use to yes. have exactly. a great journalism career and yes. Yes. write this article. Thank so you thanks, guys. Maria. And thanks for everybody for listening today thanks to The for Narrative. Having me. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of The Narrative, presented by CCV and produced by Westler Media. If you found today's episode insightful, leave us a review or rating and subscribe anywhere you get your podcasts. We're your hosts, Mike Andrews, Aaron Baer, and David Mahan, and we'll see you next time on The Narrative.